so when Ted kindly asked me and invited me to speak at this conference, the first question I had was, well, can I speak about anything? And he said, yeah, speak about whatever you want. So I decided to talk about generating data because it's something I'm really passionate about. I think it's really important. And as Ted kind of highlighted in his keynote talk, um, there's a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot of holes here with uh, the current state of data right now. So, you know, why do I want to talk about generating data? Like, I, I think it's, it's really important. Um, it's kind of the foundation of everything that you do. And I guess one thing to be really clear here, I'm not advocating uh, going out and replicating what StatsBomb is doing. I want to talk about really new data sources or new, new types of information. So it's bake-off season right now. It's my favorite time of year. Um, so I think it's a really good analogy for football analytics right now. So if you're not familiar with Bake Off, that's fine. All you need to know is there's kind of three different challenges uh, every episode. We'll talk about two of them here. So the first one is the technical challenge. So this is a, a situation where all of the bakers are given the same ingredients, uh, but not really any sort of recipe. They kind of know what the end goal is, and they, they kind of get there. And so to me, I feel like this is how football analytics is if you're kind of using the same data sources as everybody else. You're given the same ingredients, but at the end of the day, you know, you're still gonna end up with a very similar kind of cake as everybody else. Some of them are gonna be better than others, but really, you know, it's, it's kind of all the same product. But then you have the showstoppers, and this is where the bakers can get really creative. So they're able to bring in all sorts of different ingredients and build these kind of really amazing uh, cakes, I guess. Um, and, you know, so this is where people are really impressed and they say, wow, like this is, this is really different, this is really great. So this is my kind of bake-off analogy. All right, so let's talk about the different types of data that you can generate. And I guess uh, one thing I should say, I call it generating data, not collecting data, um, because I think it's really important to understand that it's a very deliberate and intentional process. Um, you're not you know, collecting data off the ground that somebody else has already generated, dusting it off, throwing it into a database. This is something that people are very intentionally thinking about, designing, defining, um, so this is really important. So first thing I wanna talk about is kind of labeling data. So this is probably something that a lot of people are already doing inside of their clubs. Um, you can think of it as, you know, coming up with labels for a, a training set so that you're um, able to use supervised machine learning uh, algorithms rather than unsu unsupervised learning. So when basketball was doing all sorts of like really cool things seven, eight years ago with the tracking data, I was always really impressed with, with what they were doing. So I'll talk about this paper in a second, but what I really wanted to highlight and I couldn't find the paper was, um, you know, they would come up with papers that were like, oh, we, we looked at, um, you know, this tracking data set and we were able to identify all the pick and rolls. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. And if you don't know what a pick and roll is, it's kind of, you know, a very choreographed interaction between two offensive players, two defensive players. So, you know, you can, you can think about, okay, how are they gonna do that with the tracking data? And they do it. But then they started doing really cool things, which is I'm gonna classify the 20 different types of pick and rolls that our coaching staff has defined for us. And coming from a, a club environment where you kind of see how complex and detail-oriented the coaching staffs are. Um, this was really amazing to me because I was like, wow, like, this is the level of detail that you really need to go down to in order to get real buy-in from the coaching staff. And I was like, well, how are they doing this? And they said, well, we're labeling like a thousand different pick and rolls along with the coaching staff. So, you know, I see that and I'm like, oh, that's, that's a lot of work but I think it's, it's worth it. And there's so much value in having those types of discussions around what are the 20 different pick and rolls, you know, what's the difference between this, does it matter or not? Um, so the, the reason I have this paper up here now, if you haven't read it, I recommend going back and doing it, is they kind of did like a hybrid approach where they had um, some clustering going on, so doing unsupervised learning and then feeding that into supervised learning. So I, I think this is, this is really cool. Um, but again, it's, it's quite difficult to have agreement upon what are those 20 different types of pick and rolls that you're doing. So to kind of highlight how difficult some of this stuff is, you know, I wanted to just show this example. So this is a video of Mexican second division, Liga de Expansión. It's kind of a lower level uh, 
league around the world. Um, but as you watch this, I want, I want you all to think about if I were to label who's in possession of the ball, you know, what would that look like? Or if I wanted to label what are the different phases of play that are going on here, how would that look? So, <laughs> Al baile del vals de so I'll let you guys enjoy this with the commentary. Uh, but just think about, you know, how consistent could I label this? And then would the person to the left or right of me, would they agree with my definitions of who has control of the ball, who's in possession, what's the phase of play here, what's, what's even going on? You know, and I, I want to do this to highlight that there's no real right answer and that there's going to be subjective definitions for all of this. But going through that process of talking about it, defining it, setting, you know, parameters for which we're going to define this is really, really important. Okay. So I'll, I'll kind of end that there. Um, so, you know, labeling data for training sets, I think it's really important. It's very time consuming. In my personal opinion, you're going to get back that time with being able to build better models, being able to evaluate the goodness of fit for them, um, all that sort of thing. But there's a lot of value in coming up with these definitions and trying to get consensus on these definitions within your team and then within your club. So another area of data generation is going to be stuff that's already happening within your club. And, you know, I've, I've been around for 10 years now in this industry. The amount of data that people are generating is just growing exponentially. Um, but it's still really difficult, I think, for clubs to get the full value out of a lot of this data. Um, so this is just a screenshot of sports code. Some of you may be familiar with it, but it's a piece of software often used in performance analysis where you have these really smart, highly trained people tagging videos, um, and every single one of those little hash marks is basically a piece of data for you to, to look at and consume. So this is a data generation process. To me, I think this is a gold mine of information within your club, but very few people are kind of leveraging it to their full potential. Um, and so there's a couple reasons here. You know, one thing that's really great about this is that hopefully your performance analysis department is coding things in a way that kind of fits within the, the way that your club views the game, the game model, footballing philosophy. Um, but they're doing it for a very different reason than perhaps a data scientist would. So often this type of data is being generated for opposition analysis, player development, team analysis. It's not really done for recruitment. It's not going to be done on a large scale. It's going to be done on very biased samples where only looking at matches from your opponent or only looking at players within your own club. Um, so I think this is really rich, useful information, but there are some logistical issues around how can you actually take this information, bring it into your data science workflow, and leverage it there to get better insights. So you know, one thing about this, your performance analysis department is probably the busiest people at the club. They have unbelievable demands from the coaching staff. Um, and so going to them and saying, hey, can you just tag you know, an extra 10 matches for me? Um, that's, that's quite a difficult conversation to have. Um, they're doing it for different purposes. And then again, you know, there's quite a biased sample with, with what they're generating. So the next one I want to talk about is computer vision. And again, this, you know, as I said, I don't want to encourage you to replicate what Statsbomb is doing. I don't want you to replicate what third-party computer vision companies are doing either. These are commercial providers. They're selling this data and information for you know, quite a high price because it is valuable, and it's also really difficult to collect. But I think there's an area where, you know, for certain purposes, and you have to think about this um, quite clearly in terms of what's the trade-off between how much time I have to invest and how much I'm going to get out of it, but I think there are, are certain instances where if you're using an off-the-shelf, open-source, computer vision, uh, I guess, algorithm, uh, you can get pretty close to, to what's up on the screen. So I think this is a, an image I stole maybe from some skill corner marketing. But the red lines are homography, or kind of the projection, the homography projection of uh, the dimensions of the pitch onto the image so that you can get a mapping between the pixel on the image back to kind of real world pitch coordinates. 
And then you can see all the players have been detected, they've been assigned to different teams or the, the referee. Um, and then they go as far as actually labeling the identities. You're not gonna get player identities from any open source software right now, but you can kind of figure out like where on the pitch players are and what team they belong to, which I think, you know, for the amount of effort it would take can be quite useful and, and something to think about. But mostly I want to talk about subjective data. Um, and subjective data, like I don't like this term just that I don't like saying data collection instead of data generation. I don't like saying subjective data because I think it implies there's something like objective data. Um, so again, data generation, it's all defined by human beings. So somebody has come and said, this is how we're gonna collect it, this is what it means. So there's all these subjective choices along the way. And you know, just to kind of put this in perspective, it wasn't that long ago that there was a data provider, they're no longer in business, surprisingly, um, but they didn't have a concept of a clearance. So they said everything is a pass because you know, we can't infer what the player was thinking, what their intention was. So we're gonna say everything is a pass. So you would have center backs with like 60% pass completions because everything was considered a pass. And you know, it started to become of limited use because you can never really understand how active defensively a center back is or you know, how good their passing ability is coming out of the back. Um, but yeah, so what I mean here for subjective data is really kind of filling in the holes between what's being collected now and where we wanna go and then also adding some sort of qualitative element to it. So not just you know, how many times does something happen, but what was the quality of those actions as they happen. So this is a little bit of a, a trip down memory lane. So this is from, yeah, 11 years ago, I guess. Um, back before I actually was working in the industry but thinking about these things a lot. Um, and so this was just a bunch of ideas I was throwing down um, of things that I wanted to collect because, you know, there was, I think, a need for stuff beyond just the, you know, what was out there in terms of Opta data and now StatsBomb data. Um, so this is a project actually I was working on with Chris Dove, who's sitting in the front row. He's currently head of Arsenal Data Analytics. Um, but a lot of this was kind of born out of our frustration of watching Alex Song. Um, so <laughs> he would do these really, like, brilliant things and you know dribble up the pitch and play like a perfect pass but then he would absolutely like make a meal of a clearance and it was really frustrating to us because we were like well that's just going down as like an incomplete pass or a clearance wasn't really capturing a lot of this so this was kind of our first stab at, at things that we were thinking of collecting to kind of go to the next level um, don't do this uh, this is not comprehensive not well thought out a lot of the things here are not important. So, you know, down at the bottom, tracking dives. Um, I don't really care if a player dives or not these days, but, um, you know, there's, there's some kind of half-baked ideas in here, some, some not so good ideas. But this is something that came up on, at dinner on Sunday, which is a really good way of doing this, um, which is the FIFA football language that came out, I think, last year. So this is a lot of really smart people thinking about how to kind of define the events of, of a football match in a, like a really robust, comprehensive manner. Um, and so I actually really like this. And if you're familiar with a lot of data visualization, they have what's called the grammar of graphics. So kind of having these individual building blocks that you can kind of pull together to make something really amazing. I think this concept of like a footballing language is our version of that, where you have these uh, very neatly defined um, units of actions. And so you can just kind of see some of the, the depth they go through in terms of how to, how to define these things. Um, it, this is all up on their website, so I recommend going and, and reading all of this. Um, so they have you know stuff that's happening on the ball, stuff that's happening off the ball. They have videos to kind of help help people understand what exactly the concept is here. Um, and then they have some really cool things like movement to receive. And so a lot of times when you're talking about subjective uh, evaluations of a player, they'll say, oh, you know, this number nine has really good movement in the box. 
well, what does that mean? And so this is a really good attempt to kind of quantify that. And all, you know, what they're doing is they're not saying good movement, bad movement. They're saying these are the different types of movement. And I think they have like eight or 10 different types of movement you can have. So, you know, this is to me really, really powerful stuff. This is another example that uh, I came across pretty recently. It was on Training Ground Guru, so I don't have any insight into what Chelsea's actually doing here. Um, if anyone knows, I would love to hear more about it. But, you know, again, people are always talking about psychological factors of players. Chelsea is, ha has a program where they're going to go through and they're going to code what they think are the important aspects of the psychological makeup of a player going on through, it, through a match. Okay, so if you wanted to do something like what FIFA is doing, it's actually really time consuming and probably way beyond the resources of an individual club. And it's very difficult to scale. So, you know, if you want to use this for recruitment, you, it's going to be really difficult to, you know, do this for every single player for every single league. Um, but again, I think, you know, that's where you can find a real advantage. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Again, it's really difficult to get consensus on some of these definitions. Like, I have no idea how long it took FIFA to come up with that language of football, but I imagine it wasn't just sitting around one afternoon. Um, and I think the last thing is that it's really difficult to know what's important. Um, so, you know, in my example, dives. I don't, I don't think that's important. Um, at some point in my life, I did. Um, and a lot of times with this type of information, until you start collecting it and seeing, you know, what's the signal to noise ratio, you don't even know if it's going to be important or not. All right, so now I want to talk about kind of the oldest subjective data out there. Um, this is stuff that every club has been collecting for God knows how long. And it's the sleep and wellness questionnaire. So just kidding. Uh, I don't. I don't like these at all. Um, if I never see one of these ever again, uh, that would be fine. Uh, there's a lot of issues with these, and I think, you know, if you're talking about definitions and consensus of what things mean, I think a lot of times sleep and wellness questionnaires aren't actually defined very well, and so that's one of the big problems is that a seven for me isn't the same as a seven for somebody else. Um, but what I really want to talk about is actually scouting reports. So the way that I'm starting to see scouts is they're just data generators. Um, these are highly knowledgeable people generating really good data and information, but nobody's really thinking about how can we do this in a very structured way where we have consensus about what good movement means. We have consensus about how a player should orient their body when they receive the ball. So, you know, this is, this is one of the key things that I want you guys to take away from this is that there's just an infinite number of ways that you can generate data, um, but you need to be really deliberate about how you're defining this and kind of how um, you want to record this. So this is just uh, a little, uh, I guess, cartoon to end with. So, nah, I don't think it will work. Let's do something different, something smarter, something cooler. Um, and I think every like team within a football club has probably done something with this cartoon or the other one where it's like, oh, I'm too busy to get help. Um, but what I wanted to kind of point out here is that dealing with this type of subjective data isn't really anything new with, with football. Like it's, football isn't the first industry that has to deal with these questions of generating data that might not necessarily have clear definitions. Um, there's, you know, whole aspects of social science research that's really, you know, trying to tackle these questions where people don't have, like, really clean data sets and they have to, to make their own. Um, so this is my motivation for all of you is, you know, go out there, learn about social science, learn about how other people are solving these problems, and then try to bring that back to your, your football club and apply it. So just key takeaways, data generation is hard, but you control it. Definitions matter, and I think there's a lot of value in just having those conversations about what does this mean, what does that mean, what's the difference between this and that. And lastly, have fun and just be creative. So that's all. Thank you.